Good afternoon. Uh, this is the first time I've been in Utah, and I have to say I'm very impressed. I will be coming back. I will be coming back. As Tammy said, I am a registered dietitian background, more so in public health. And uh, hailing from central Iowa, I have a great flavor of uh, food system options for me in Iowa. But today we're going to focus more on policy and explore what food system policy is all about and connect the dots maybe with the health of eaters and the health of the community, farms, and public health. So one, one of the things I want to accomplish today is kind of lay the, the groundwork, the foundation for you, and then uh, share some examples, some innovative strategies that especially those of you who are going to be working in public health could hopefully implement in the near future. And maybe even have some discussions, since our group is just a little bit smaller today. How many of you have already had an agronomy or a hort class? I didn't either. I didn't either. Um, but when Fred Kirschman, Fred Kirschman um, gave me some writings of Wendell Berry, and I came across this quote, I thought, wow, that has a lot of relevance to what I do, but I'm missing something. And it somewhat demonstrated the disconnects, not only in my knowledge, but perhaps even disconnects within our food system. So for example, do we always know where our food came from? Do we know how it was grown? Do we know how long it spent in transport or how many miles it was actually transported? Do we know what really happens with processing? How many of you can identify all of the ingredients in a Twinkie? So we have these disconnects in our food system. And Wendell Berry's quote you know, definitely reminded me of that. As a dietitian, though, uh, being trained as a clinical dietitian, first of all, and then put out in public health uh, nutrition, I thought that nourishment and good health started here. You know, when you got sick, right? That's when you need to learn about nutrition. But the more that I've been working in food systems over the years, the more that I've come to realize that in order to have a healthy food system, we have to have a healthy environment. Okay? And I'm going to go through some of these elements with you in a bit. But again, Fred Kirschman at the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture gave me some uh, other readings, he's a philosopher and um, likes to share his wealth of knowledge, gave me some readings from Sir Albert Howard. Sir Albert Howard was a, an agronomist from the UK in the, tw in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. He traveled the world and he studied the soil and plants and communities. And what he found was that the villages that did not thrive really had poor or weak natural resources. Their environments could not sustain food production, they had poor water quality, and that was a direct reflection on the health of that village. And so even in the 20s and 30s, Sir Albert Howard was connecting these dots. So as agronomists and horticulturists, they know the science proves that healthy soil grows healthy food. Well, as a dietitian, I know that healthy food nourishes healthy people. And if you're in public health, you know that healthy people live in healthy communities. And so in summary, that's how we connect the dots between the health of our environment, the health of our food system, and the health of individuals. So my charge today is to talk about this word policy. Policy is not a four-letter word, you'll notice. But when I say policy, what are some of the first things that come to mind? What do you think of? Rules, yeah, what else? Government. Government. What else? When I say policy, what comes to mind? Politicians? Middle-aged men in suits? What else? What do you think about policy? USDA. Pardon? USDA. USDA as a federal agency? What else? I heard another... I'm sorry. Paperwork. Paperwork. <laughs> yeah, paperwork. Do you see laws in books, in lawyers' offices? Okay. 
I hope that within the next 45 minutes or so, you'll see policy in a different light today and hopefully identify easy ways of implementing policy at an individual, a, a organizational community, and a public policy level. So hang in there with me. We're going to set the foundation here. So policy is a plan of action agreed to by a group of people with the power to carry it out, support, and enforce it. We most often think about laws and regulations, right? Laws and regulations. And that really falls under the public policy uh, group of, of, of things, whether it's at a local or county level, a state level, a federal level, and even at an international level. But we can also have guidelines, principles, uh, directions, and values, whether they're individual or organizational values, that also help guide decision making. And those things can happen at these other levels as well. And so we often don't think about um, the decisions that we make, for example, about the food that we choose to eat as a value and as a personal policy. So personal policies is just a segue to explore the broader paradigm of policies. So public policy, as we know, is developed through a process that involves input from all of us, from government, state agencies, and other organizations, industries as well, uh, as well as staff and elected officials, and it guides how federal, state, and local government operate and address specific issues or problems. What's interesting about how our current public policies are formed, they usually are a result of what? complaint or a problem, right? But as nutrition and public health folks, this opens up an opportunity of being able to advance public policy that really promotes the health of a community or of a specific population. And so that's where I think we have just a fantastic opportunity of influencing policymakers because we can go to them with solutions. Right? We're equipped with those solutions. We're just not going to them with policies or with problems and complaints to create more policies. We actually have the tools to encourage them to create policies that support health, which I think is really unique. It puts us in a, in a really unique spot. Advocacy, on the other hand, is when we take our knowledge to decision makers and tell them what we know. So for example, how many of you are currently working on a research project? What are you working on? Okay, great. So the outcome of your child nutrition research could be shared with either your local decision makers or your state decision makers so that they are better equipped to make better decisions. So that's kind of advocacy, outreach, and education. Lobbying, on the other hand, is when we are going forward to a policymaker with a specific ask. So, for example, um, let's see here, Orrin Hatch is one of your senators, correct? And I think he serves on, he serves on the health committee with my Senator Harkin from Iowa. So we have just had child nutrition reauthorization passed. And USDA now is in the process of gathering more feedback and creating the regulations for child nutrition programs. But we have the Farm Bill coming up as well. And we have health elements within the Farm Bill, specifically Title IV, dealing with food access and health issues. So you could go to Senator Hatch and say, Senator, this bill is coming up, and I would like you to vote this way. So that's a form of lobbying. Um, there is kind of a fine line between advocacy and lobbying, but when you're actually going to make a specific ask of a policymaker, whether it's your um, board of supervisors at the local level, it could be your state legislator, or it could be your congressional folks, but when you make that specific ask to have them vote in a certain way, that's a form of lobbying. Is that clear? Is that okay. So that's the policy component. Let's set the stage then for talking more about food systems. And this is a, an extremely oversimplified model of a food system, but just to create the framework, if you will. Well, first of all, we've got to start with production, don't we? 
because we have to grow food, whether it's plant or protein. And it's not just in one way, is it? We have a variety of ways in which we can access food. We can choose to grow it ourselves. We can hunt or fish. And is that pretty popular here, hunting and fishing? So that's another way of getting food to our table. There's also foraging and gleaning and things like that. The next step is what we call transformation. That's our processing stage. That's where we take raw ingredients and create it into something else. We've got packaging and labeling um, involved with that as well. Marketing is a big component of transformation. And then food has to go places, right? So we have this distribution and retailing part. Um, food gets transported all over the world today. And in fact, a study done by the Leopold Center for Sustainable Ag a few years ago documented that in central Iowa, a majority of our fresh fruits and vegetables travel an average of 1,496 miles before it reaches our plate in central Iowa. And I'm guessing you might have a similar scenario, although you're a little bit closer to California than what we are. And then we have where we actually purchase our food at. So we have the food access and consumption sector, and that includes where we purchase our food. So think about where you actually give money to somebody for food, whether it's at a grocery store, um, perhaps it's a restaurant. Um, any of you a CSA member, where you actually buy a share in a CSA? Um, it might be at a convenience store, might be downstairs in this building as example. But then we also have that part of, of uh, food access and consumption in which we need to prepare food and or preserve food. Um, and so that's part of that equation as well. And lastly, the, the, the sector that probably gets the least amount of attention at this point is waste management. Wastes are generated throughout the entire system. It's not just at the end, but there's continual wastes that are generated. So that's just a, a simplified uh, diagram of a food system. Now, this is where things get a little bit complicated because we've got a lot of inputs and influences and a lot of things that are being imposed on these different sectors. So first, we have our inputs. We've got our natural, human, and economic inputs. This afternoon, I'm going to be talking more about those natural inputs. And by that, I mean we need to have things such as soil, water, sunlight, energy to grow food. We need biodiversity in both our seed and our animal stock. Okay, so those are our natural inputs. But we also need economic inputs and human capital as well, don't we? We need people to do this work in the system. But we have a whole cadre of influences as well. And so those influences may be our social values, cultural trends, it may be our religious beliefs, Income, what's one of the hottest topics in the media today? Is the price of gas? That is too. What else? What, the, the price of fuel affects what? The price of food. Okay. Our household budgets are an influence as to what we choose to purchase as well. But we also have education research and technology. Well, being a land-grant institution and having a uh, significant college of agriculture here on this campus, there's a lot of research and technology that is probably influencing this equation, right? Many of you are probably doing that. And we also have policies. So this is where we're going to focus today, is how policies impact the food system. But we're not done. We have a whole host of things that come out that result from our systems. So we have human health impacts, we have economic impacts, we have social impacts, and definitely ecological impacts. And so this is an oversimplified model of a very complicated, very complicated system. Any questions with that? Okay. Now, if anyone is a master at creating 3D graphics, I want to get connected with you because after putting together this model, I'm wondering if there's a way of combining this with the previous model. So I want you to think about the last time you bought groceries. How many of you don't buy groceries? Let me ask you that. Everybody buys groceries. Okay, think about the last time you bought groceries. 
Where do you think that food came from? Anybody? Where do you think that food came from? Yes? All over the world. Can you give me an example of what you bought that probably came from another country? Okay. Great example. Great example. Who else? Got an example of what you bought last? Yes. Great. Great, great example. So we have an international or global example. And how far away from you are from Northern California? Okay, so I'd call that maybe regional even. Okay, so that's kind of a regional example. Where does your milk come from in this part of the state? Do you have a local dairy? You do have a local dairy. How far of a area are they pulling milk in, do you think? What was that? 25 miles maybe? Okay, so that might even be a community or a local example. How many of you grow your own food? How many of you have patio or container gardening or a backyard garden? Awesome. How many of you work on the uh, uh, student organic farm? Awesome. So that in itself is kind of a household model because you're actually growing food for yourself. But what's happened with our current food system is we as a society in general are heavily dependent upon those top two tiers, aren't we? So we're a little lopsided. We have great dependence on a national and global food system. And not so much on the bottom. So when we talk about um, issues of national security, um, national food security, national nutrition food, food security. We have created a system which I don't think is terribly resilient, it's not sustainable, and introduces a whole host of vulnerabilities, which if you want to hear more about that, you can come this afternoon. But in order to generate a more resilient food system, one in which in the event that our national and global food system has some type of an event that impacts our access to food. For example, if oil does get to two and three hundred dollars a barrel, how will that impact our food supply? Because food is so global. I propose this. We need to have a more balanced food system structure in which that responsibility for production processing, distribution, and access is shared among the variety of, of levels, and that it's not solely dependent on one level or another. Okay. Now, I'm still working on this definition, so if you have any suggestions, I'm open to them. But So what do we get when we combine food system and policy? So I think it's the combined efforts of individuals, organizations, governments, and industries to influence the decision-making environment of how food is grown, how it's processed, distributed, marketed, consumed, and disposed in order to further economic, environmental, health, and social objectives. When I read this the other day, I thought, boy, Angie, that's really Pollyannish of you. Um, because what's the real reason why, why we produce food? What's the real reason why we process food? What is the main driver beha behind most decisions within our food system, do you think? Is it for social justice reasons? No. Is it for environmental reasons? No. Majority of the decisions around our food supply are on what? It's the bottom line, folks. It's economics. It's economics, but this is where you all can come into play. You all can share your knowledge with, with decision makers to show that health is an economic driver as well. It's an economic driver as well. You know, and, and when we develop policy, it's not like an overnight thing, although in the state of Wisconsin, um, they obviously have a different approach to implementing policy in the state of Wisconsin if you've been watching the collective bargaining process there. But um, it usually starts, especially on a personal level, with a thought. 
It might be an observation. So for example, um, maybe you observe a neighbor putting in a, taking out the lawn and putting in edibles. So fruit trees and vegetable beds and things like that. So you observe that and you wonder what that's all about. And so that idea has you reading more information about gardening, for example. And maybe the following year you actually create a couple container pots where you've got, I don't know, tomatoes and peppers. And then you share that information of the, of the knowledge that you have learned with maybe your social network. And maybe you get together and say, hey, our community has these vacant lots in which we could start community gardens. Oh, but in order to do that, we need to go and share our information with um, the city council. We need to ask about what ordinances are in place as to the use of vacant lots. And if they're not suitable for supporting community gardens, then we need to lobby for ordinances to support community gardens. So it's not a, a process that you necessarily intend to happen. It sometimes evolves. Um, and it you know, may take a little bit of time to percolate. But when we start to get to a point where we want to make change within our food system, we should really have a goal. We should have a, at least a sense of where we want to be or what we want to try to achieve. And uh, in developing some materials a few years ago for the American Dietetic Association, Allison Harmon, who's at Montana State University, and I crafted this. This is kind of our, our values and our principles that we use with creating the advocacy and public policy pieces that we have. A sustainable and resilient food system, first and foremost, conserves and renews natural resources. It advances social justice it, and animal welfare. It builds community wealth, meaning that uh, wealth is not extracted from a community. Our, our food dollars don't leave our community, but our food dollars stay within the community. And last but not least, I think the most important is that the food system needs to assure that the food and nutrition needs of all eaters are met now and in the future. Because you see, we can feed people, but you can probably quote the epidemiological data much better than I can, but are we a healthy population? Are we? No. We have a lot of work to do. And if we lose sight of what we want to achieve, especially the food and nutrition piece for all eaters, now and in the future, that will help um, guide a lot of our decisions. OK. So another model here for you. Like I said, we've got policy happening at all different levels. And I totally stole the socio-ecological model, which many of you are probably familiar with, and adapted to my needs. So. Um, for our purposes today, when we talk about individual and interpersonal policy, it's our knowledge and our attitude and our values. It even includes our immediate social network, which I think um, on a campus is, is, is pretty critical. But we also have things such as organizational policy. So in, in our case today, that could be the university's policy. And I have a really awesome example of what is happening on campus that could be considered an organizational policy. So in the Monday, yeah, Monday Statesman paper, on the front cover was the Be Well article that looks at uh, menu labeling for restaurants here on campus. Are any of the students in this room that are behind this? Well, this is a really good example of how we have three dietetic students who are moving forward and creating a menu labeling program. And according to the article, they need to propose this to the food service manager here on campus. So if that becomes a standard, they're probably going through the same steps that I outlined earlier, where they have to increase their knowledge, they need to share that knowledge with others, put things in place, and then hopefully lobby to make this the standard on campus. So I thought this was a really good example of organizational policy because it's changing the food environment here on campus. Community policy is our social values. It's our ethos that, that we connect with. 
And the community garden example would be an example of that. Another example would be your faith-based communities who in, in Iowa especially, they have a lot of land. Our faith-based communities have a lot of land that often just gets mowed. Uh, we have a interesting project that's happening in Des Moines in which our faith-based communities are coming together. They are taking out their lawn. They're actually putting in vegetable and fruit, vegetable gardens and fruit orchards. And they are then donating that, that uh, produce to food banks and food pantries in the area. So that is an example where community has come together to really make a difference in their food system. And then the top tier, of course, is our public policy, our local, state, uh, federal, and international food system policy. So this is where things get complicated again. When we have food systems and we have food system policy, what does that look like? Well, it's an imp putting the two models together. But the best way of looking at that is really in a matrix. And this is just a sampling of some of the ideas that came out of a paper in the Journal of Hunger and Environmental Nutrition a couple years ago that really looks at aligning food system policies to advance the health of all eaters. So for example, let's work on the individual level. How many of you have an idea of what you can do at an individual level um, in the consumption area? That's an easy one. Okay, so an individual policy, a decision that you're going to make in the consumption arena. Any ideas? This is an easy one. Buy locally. Buy locally. What does that mean? <coughs> Pardon? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so the value or the, or the policy that one may, may have individually is buying directly from farmers, for example. Yeah, excellent example. What else? On an individual level, what could you do from a waste management standpoint? Do we have um, composting available either in the dorms or in food service here or at home? Is food being composted? Could it be? Could it be? So that would be an example. What about in the production area? What could you do as an individual um, to boost individual production of food? We've already got some people working on the student organic farm, right? What else? Any other ideas for personal food production? Oh, awesome. Learn how to make your own bread. And where would you get that skill from, that knowledge and that skill from? The internet, anywhere. In the internet? Everywhere out there. Absolutely. And you could maybe share that knowledge with your friends who might be interested in doing that. Great idea. Okay, let's move on to organizational level. What could we do, let's say, on campus from a food distribution standpoint? What could we do? What happens to the excess food from food service here on campus? Does anybody know? Gets thrown away. Could it be transformed to something else? Do you have a uh, food pantry on campus? Okay. So is that a possibility of connecting leftovers from food service to the food pantry on campus maybe? That could be an organizational policy. What about at the community level? What kinds of community things could we do, uh, let's see here, from a transformation? Okay, so what could we do at a community level to perhaps increase the processing of food? What could we do? Are there community kitchens in the area? Are there, um, are there licensed facilities that could be leased out to small producers, perhaps? What about using uh, churches kitchens to process food? Those are ideas of, of community policies that could be in place. So let's jump into our public policy 
Has anyone gone to talk to the mayor of Logan? Nobody. Has anyone gone to talk to the president of the university? I'll start there. Or the provost? No one. Um, has anyone gone to talk to the dean about maybe changing a policy within the college? Well, we've got lots of opportunities if you haven't here. Okay, so let's talk about let's talk about um, public policy at the city of Logan level. Okay, what can be done uh, in any of these sectors to advance a food system within Logan? What are some ideas? Yes. Perfect. So a gleaning program, gleaning. program of sorts. Perfect example. Thanks. What else can we done at a, do at a community level to influence policy? What about the ordinances that are in place within the city? We were just having a conversation about uh, small livestock within city limits. You know that you can. Up to 25 chickens, my understanding, and pigs, and goats maybe. Oh, okay, okay. So you can actually have fresh eggs and still live within city limits. That's not necessarily the case in other communities. What about at the state level? What can be done at the state level to influence food policy? The farm to school program, excellent example. How many of you are familiar with farm to school? Farm to school connects area farmers with local schools, okay? A really great way of getting your feet wet with that program is if your school has a fruit and vegetable snack program, which is a federal program that is, um, helps advance the consumption of fruits and vegetables, especially among elementary school kids. But it's a great way of dabbling in farm to school, so connecting schools with farms. Excellent idea. What else can we do to influence policy at the state level? Yes? Um, so which program now allows the people to purchase fresh Yes. Yes. Perfect example. So, one of the things that I would ask, and I don't know the policy in Utah, you'll have to tell me. So, if I were a WIC participant, can I go to the farmer's market in Logan and use my WIC cash value voucher for fruits and vegetables there? Do you know if you can or not? You can't? Okay, here's, here's a great idea then. So, go to your state health department that administers WIC and talk to them about what can we do to increase fruit and vegetable consumption among WIC participants. Can we have the policy to support them using their WIC cash value vouchers for fruits and vegetables at farmers markets. That's a perfect example. Excellent. What about at the federal level? What kinds of change do you want to see our congressional folks make at the federal level? What kind of changes? Anything. Yes. Okay, and child nutrition reauthorization just was passed, and we made modest strides in that area, but have a lot more work to do, don't we? Don't we? Yep, because school lunch, school feeding um, is really directed at the federal level. See, what I think people may not fully appreciate is that food dictates, or policy dictates, what is grown, what is harvested, what is processed, packaged, labeled imported, exported, traded, sold, and ultimately available for us to purchase. Policy dictates everything. Anyone interested in food safety regulations? Is anyone interested in antibiotic use in livestock facilities? Is anybody interested in commodity supports? Is anyone interested in um, appropriate funding for rural development to bring back fruit and vegetable processing. 
All of those can be determined at this federal level, just as examples. So one of my chart, oh, this is an, oh, yes, I forgot this. So this was a little side-by-side -side comparison that I put together as examples of what the Centers for Disease Control is monitoring, um, monitoring across states. These are their policy indicators that they're using. So how many of our grocery stores are within 0.5 miles of heavily populated, populated areas? So in Utah, 73.2% of the census tracts do have healthy food retail or a full-fledged grocery store or supermarket within a half a mile. That's fantastic. You're ahead of Iowa on that one. How many of you have state-level healthier food policies? We actually, this, and this is a little dated, this is a 2009 document, but in Iowa we have the Healthy Kids Act where we actually are going above and beyond the federal policies for school feeding programs. Um, looking at farmers markets. Now I hope my data for farmers markets is correct, but you don't have that many here in Utah? Okay, is that correct? So, per hundred, and you have a population just under three million, correct? Or about three million, about the same as Iowa? So you have about one farmers market per hundred thousand Utahns. Might not be totally um, if you really want to increase access to fresh, locally grown fruits and vegetables, look at where farmers markets are at. Here, this goes back to your idea of uh, WIC Farmers Market Nutrition Program and the cash value voucher being used at farmers markets. So once again, if you don't have the farmers markets, then that may not be worth the time at this point to invest in getting more WIC participants to farmers markets if they're not available, okay? Um, state level farm to school policies. We implemented that in Iowa a couple years ago. Um, it's on the books, but the appropriation has been removed, unfortunately. But we do have active farm to school chapters across Iowa. That would be a phenomenal um, project to be taken on here in Utah. State Food Policy Council. We're in our second generation in Iowa. Um, I believe Utah had a state level food policy council maybe about eight or ten years ago. Currently I didn't see any indication that there was one, but there is a food policy task force that has been started I think under the mayor's office in Salt Lake City. And so why not create a food system or a food policy council here on campus? That would be something to do. In connecting the dots, the one thing that I do want you to take home today is that when we make decisions about how food is grown and what food is grown, the quality, quantity, and biodiversity of food that's grown here in this country, it directly affects the status of our food system. And the status of our food system directly affects our health care system. Do you think health care reform is really going to be as effective as it could be if we had food system reform as well? You have a comment about that? Okay. So, with that in mind, um, hopefully I've equipped you with a few tools to think about how you as individuals, how you as a university or a community can hopefully put some policies in place, place to support a healthier food system for all. And so the charge that I want to leave you with today is what will you do in the next 30 or 45 days? Is it going to be to seek more information? Is it going to be talk to other people? Is it going to be to start something? Is it going to be setting a meeting with a, a policy maker? Is there anything that really inspires you to create change in a food system? And what is it going to be? Does anybody have any ideas? Anything that really gets you jazzed up? Anything? Okay, so excellent, excellent question. What I would do is maybe connect with some far, with the farmers who are already supplying at the farmers market, just to see what that network is all about, 
And then I would also check to see if there is a farmer's market association for the state. In many states there are. I don't know about Utah, if there is one or not. And get some more information from those folks. And then maybe a little assessment might be warranted to see where the challenges are and what can be done to get Utah to that next level with having some more farmers markets. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think a lot of states struggle with that. A lot of states struggle with that. Excellent idea. Any other ideas about what you might do in the next 30 to 45 days? Well, if not, you don't need to share with it. Go ahead. Plant a garden. And now is the time to think about that, isn't it? So it's an online local food ordering system. And what was the name of it? Utah's own? Bountiful Basket. Great. We have the Iowa Food Cooperative that uses that model. Yeah, excellent. So I'm going to end with that. I want to thank uh, Tammy and, and the college for inviting me to campus today. This has really been a, a wonderful treat for me. So any questions?